Hello, we are going to start. Welcome everyone to this session on uh, Monday. So you feel relieved that you delivered the exercise three, yeah, I guess. You feel happy? So you're going to get a new homework, don't worry, it's a never ending story. <laughs> um, yeah, a bit about the homework. We have, we are going to have at the end five sets, okay, I think six will be too much for you, but we are going to have five sets. So one I will publish this week, and the deadline will be after Easter, one of the days after Easter. But I recommend you to work on that and try to get it done by before Easter, so you can just be happy and enjoy whatever you're going to be in, in Easter. And I think it's possible to do it. Actually, one of the exercises we are going to solve the first part here in class, and then you have to do sensitivity based on this HISIS file. So I think that should help. And yeah, and the other set I will publish after Easter, uh, after we have covered some topics. Uh, also, something else about the topics that are we have to cover. So today we are going to talk a bit about uh, transportation, multiphase flow transportation. And here plays a big role, is kind of, uh, we're going to touch a little bit flow assurance. So just so you know what's, what is the word about and what kind of things you have to take into account when we talk about flow assurance. But really there is a full course about it and if you're interested, you're welcome to take them and to get more details and to do more in-depth analysis. We're going to touch it very tangentially. So we have that for today, and we are going to also to explore a bit. We haven't worked too much with HISIS, and I think it will be good to do, at least for the next set, you will need it in one problem. So I want to take you also, almost do it with you uh, in class, to show you how you set up the, ish, the problem, and then you are by yourself to do uh, the sensitivity analysis. You have to do by yourself the, the sensitivity analysis. <coughs> so that will be also HISIS usage. Remember also that the main goal of the course is not to make you kind of fully expert users on the software, but just to do so you understand a bit about the software, you have been exposed a bit to how it works, and also, but more, Im more importantly, to s that you understand what is behind so you can use it in a, in a more powerful way. Courses you can get, uh, after you are in the company, you can get any kind of courses that you like. Uh, the companies will come and they offer you tutorials, courses, you pay more, you get this and that. But uh, what we are aiming for is the fundamentals. Uh, then we have uh, production enhancement techniques. And these are really techniques or uh, methods that we use just to, like the name indicates, to boost production. And uh, we will see that uh, there are some techniques also, we are going to touch them tangentially, not too much. I am going to give a quite a detailed explanation about ESP, electric submersible pumps, uh, because I think that's important to, because we also use that for other kind of boosting, okay? Then we have gas lift. I'm going to talk also a little bit on that, and that will be in connection with optimization. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, uh, multiphase boosting. And the particular case of wet gas compression. In the previous courses, uh, that topic was very upfront. Actually, we covered it during the first three weeks. But I think it's more natural just to show you first without any help, external help, and then by the end to tell you what can you do to your production system if you already see that it produces something that you're not happy with it or you want to get more value out of it. What can you do and how can you plan your, your uh, kind of your help to the system? Uh, 
and then we're going to discuss a, a bit about but not much just on a kind of appreciation level like I call it um, to increase the number of wells we have been already talking a bit about it in the exercise so we are going just going to put it formal increase number of wells okay maybe stimulation We are going to talk also a bit about, I think it's very important, especially something that you're going to be exposed later in your professional life to model-based optimization or optimization of production systems. <coughs> and what was what it, you know, what it consists of, what do you do in optimization, and we will try actually, I think the example, we will try to take an example of gas lift, so that's why I need to explain you a little bit uh, how gas lift works, for those of you who don't have the background. And I'm not sure if we are going to do an example with pumps yet, or with, um, or with routing, okay? It depends on which one I think is more valuable for you. And some general general comments about optimization. And then uh, we are going to talk about dynamics of marine structures. Okay. And of course, we are not uh, like is the idea again is not to make you experts, but just to show you the principles. And then we can try to do a, 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 an exercise. And I think um, the next set of exercise will be about uh, pressure drop calculations in multiphase flow, like what we have done in class, but you have to do it by yourself. Generation of black oil tables using HISIS. That is something that we also discussed in class. And this exercise about uh, flow assurance that we are going to make today, just a bit more in depth to make you to analyze some things. And the other exercise is going to be about optimization. Uh, and I'm, w I'm not sure yet, but it might be with optimization and to, to take one of the systems that we already analyzed, like the Snow White or the, um, the Gulfax, and to install to put a wet gas compression and to do the design using the wet gas compression. Okay. So that I think um, that's, that one is usually a lot of fun to do it. Not because it's difficult, but because you enjoy it so much. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's it, I think. That's what we have left. Uh, and there are two this week and next week teaching. And then we have four more weeks after Easter. But we will try to finish a bit early, okay? To be at least, maybe I, I hope I don't need more than two weeks or two and a half weeks after Easter. Okay. Any questions? No. Ah, okay. And we also have <laughs> we also have one class about usage of Prosper and Gap. A practice class or a, a problem class. And that's probably going to be as after Easter. I want to finish before Easter with this part, okay? And maybe to talk also about optimization. And all the leftovers, uh, we will take it after Easter, okay? Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, anybody wanted to comment something about the exercise? Any doubt that anyone had or a question that didn't leave you sleep doesn't leave you sleep at night or but the answer was it very different or yeah, it's very different. really different, different mm-hmm 
split factors we got, and we got different production profiles. And the problem is the conditions of success time. Because they were going for the at the same time. But uh, I, I saw a question on this learning, and it, they say that they got different split factors. But they got one of them was 0 0.46012, and the other one was 0 0.46013. And they say it's very different, OK? Yeah, was that case? Yeah? It, you should get because it's equilibrium. Equilibrium is usually unique. Okay, it's a unique point of equilibrium. So maybe the setup, the tolerance, what I was explaining on its learning is that you have to use a proper tolerance or low enough to be sure that you have reached a converged result. Okay, and that's very important. And sometimes it's a bit difficult to to make sure that you are this tolerance is being honored. Okay. So For me, I changed the solver options, precision, mm -hmm. and I checked with, I iterated on PWS and I iterated on rates, and I also used TSP filter zero, and calculated collision rates, and gave the same answer, but it was different from ours. Might be also the way you're setting up the system of equations. Have you done it the same way we have done it in class? Yeah? Yes, very much. Yeah, so maybe we can, you can show it later. Yeah. Uh, so what have you done at the end? You have two solutions, so you have to work I twice. I split factors on that, but I just showed how to calculate it. And I wrote in the comments. Okay. Yep. Uh, also, the calculation of GP will make a uh, difference. Because in GP, we, we can either take uh, the rate from the previous year, mm -hmm. or the rate of the previous year, and this year and divide it by two. So we take the average. Uh, divided, well, actually, you can use that's. I prefer either you use the rate from the previous year and you assume that it's constant, mm -hmm. or you use the trapezoidal rule. If you're going to use the rate of the current year, I prefer that you use some kind of um, use of the current year. Okay. Because using this would give an additional year. Yeah. It's, it's very different, I told you. The GP, why is it so important, GP? Because GP tells us reservoir pressure, okay? The, how much I'm producing. And it's very important to have, especially in networks, to have a very well, a very good calculation, a very good estimation of GP. So this was just a, um, a simplification to use a step, but just take it into account. This learning you take it to later for your professional life, okay? You have to use a, a kind of a, consistent and uh, pro uh, accurate way to, to compute the GP, okay. especially if the rates change dramatically from one year to another. Hmm. Um, maybe we can go and check one of the answers. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, for example, yours. <laughs> no, nothing personal, just because you participated, so. Okay, so let's see, plots, plots, plots. Okay, recovery factor, that's correct. Every time you increase the number of wells, you can reach a higher recovery factor. And why is that? Because you have less pressure drop, it's like you have, uh, like I told you last class, you have a source, which is the reservoir, and you have a sink, which is the separator. And you, when you have one well, you just put this kind of a parallel, it's not exactly like that, but it's kind of a pipe between this source and this sink. And when you put a lot of pipes in between, then you are in a way reducing the pressure drop. But of course, this has kind of a limited effect. Initially, it's very, uh, very big, and then it destabilizes. Because remember, after that, you have also a pipeline. And that you're not adding a lot of pipelines. You're just leaving the same system. So you're just helping part of the system, not all of it. Uh, yeah, NPV, that's OK. Break even time. And after 12 wells, you don't have, actually, you never recover. All the time, the NPV is negative. Hmm? 
that's correct uh, let's see where is the plot that I want to see it's not here the NPV versus number of wells okay actually it's going to you never have this going this this curve going up and then going down so why is that why do you think is that anybody simulated for less wells to see how it gave yeah. you did you get up and down yeah so let's see that what is your name Fagiros. Okay. Actually, when you put it for a, and actually you have to, you have to have three wheels, so it begins to go up, 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 and then down. And really, the main, the main, the way why this particular case behaves like that is because I'm not sure if you have seen the cost of the, if you have a bit curious about the cost of the LNG plant and the ships, and the and all the system. It's actually is very expensive. It's a very almost like in the case of Goliath. It's almost like almost not not much, but almost like a marginal project where everything is very expensive, and really it's almost there in the limit between l pay between uh, economical and non-economical. So really, when you add another well, the benefit or the revenue that that well is bringing into the system, it really doesn't compensate the extra drillix that you have to pay for the well. Okay, but that's because all of the other costs that you have built in behind the project. Okay, things that you cannot remove, like LNG, like the ships, like uh, what else did we have in that case? The pipeline, okay. Um, let's see, and then we had the issue of the, the two, the Gulfax reservoir, okay, and that's how it looks like. Initially, you calculate the split factor, and the split factor was, I think, close to three and close to seven, okay. And then they kept like that for almost year six, for six years, more or less. And then you got that at this point, template M was already fully open, okay. You get a negative delta P, and you had to fully open that choke of that template, and you had to compensate with template L, which was much more powerful. That means that it had, you could increase the rate and that could produce much more, okay? And after that, this, uh, you have, you reach fully open choke in template L, and then the, the total production, you have no place for where to, to keep up the rate, and then begins to decline. So here is where you got two different split, uh, and they were dif very different, six point what? Okay. Zero point seven and zero point two six. Okay. Yeah, maybe we have to look at your case in particular to see what what was. Uh, where is the other case? Okay, and the other case, by contrast, you see that the template L all the time increases and template M, it decreases all the time. Okay, and that's because you're updating depending on the open choke run you're all the time updating and producing more from L and less from M and this case uh, really was a bit tricky to uh, because when you see the idea also this was to illustrate that when you have a lot of nodes or a lot of junctions it's a bit difficult to set up the problem how to solve your system with your solver okay that was the main issue so this issue was First, that you understand hydraulic equilibrium, and then that you find a way, a creative way, to solve the system using Excel, okay? Because you can very well try to solve the equations, the system of equations, just by hand. But the idea is also to, to, to force you or to 
show you or to test that if you can do it also using Excel. If you understand enough the equations, what have to be equal in the equilibrium to um, yeah, to to find the to be able to find the the equ equilibrium. Okay. Any question on that? Well, now we go to the topic that we had for today, which is actually multiphase flow transportation. Multiphase flow transport. Okay. And really the main question, um, so also one note, uh, maybe you already know, you already realize, but these tools that we have been given about solving the network, about the hydraulic performance of the systems, you can use it either when you are in the development phase, just to see what different kind of systems you can have, where are you going to place your wells to and be able to produce how much you will, you will be able to produce, or you can use it also when you are in the operational phase, when you already have a system, okay? The difference between the two is that in the development phase, you can do changes in your system, depending on your findings, you can do changes and you can just say exactly, this well is better not to drill it from here, but to here, here is better to put this kind of flow line, here we will get, you know, the optimum number of wells is this one. When you are really in operations, you are in a way and I kind of discussed that at the beginning of the course, that you are locked, you are kind of trapped in a solution. You already are trapped with an existing system and you have to learn to live with kind of the deficiencies that it has, okay? And you have to learn how to exploit all the advantages or how you can do, rem and remember also, when we are in the development phase, we are able to invest, you know, there is money to invest. When we are in the operational phase, unless we are going to promise the moon to someone, okay? They won't, be, they won't be so happy that you say, okay, now I want to make this modification. They are going to ask all the time why, because any modification costs money after the system is already built. So really, and we have to cope with these deficiencies and we have to try to exploit the most, the advantages that the system has, okay? So the first um, is, okay, so multi-phase flow transport, as you saw, is very important to see well performance and to see how much fluid I will be able to produce. But the main point is just to see if I have enough energy, if I have to produce the desired rate. That's one of the main purposes, and s why is that so important? Especially nowadays, as you all the times hear these words that the fields are longer, the fields are deeper, the fields are, I don't know, stronger, or they use all of these R in the phrases. But it's really because the, we want to, all the time, like in the case of Goliath, okay, we are making this platform, and we are, the idea is to tie in wells, or to tie in fields in the future, other fields in the future. The idea is also to, to do substitute shore, okay? That we don't have to put a platform very close to the wells, but actually we can transport all of those fluids to the, directly to the shore. And that involves long, longer transportation distances. Okay? That we want to make sure especially in the case of Snow White, we want to make sure that I will be able to transport these liquids and they are going, not going, maybe I, maybe you say, okay, this some, there will be some gas reaching the facilities, but I want exactly that the rate that I want, the economical rate, I will be able to produce that rate for at least certain period of time. Longer transportation distances. Um, also, when we talk about subsea, we have low temperatures. And we need an accurate prediction of pressure and temperature drop
in transportation pipes. Okay. And transportation pipes, I refer here like you commingle the production from different wells and then at the end you put that in a pipeline. So long transport, basically on long transportation pipelines. In transportation pipes or pipelines. <clears throat> so that's, and that's what we call really this area is what we call or what is referred to typically as flow assurance. Okay, it's flow assurance in a way is to make sure that I will be able to produce the hydrocarbons or I will be able to transport the hydrocarbons from the source all the way to the processing facilities. Ensure, so flow assurance. A, su a, su sex a su successful And of course, there are many things that play a role, and we are going to mention some of them. And as I told you, we don't have time. Is if we want to cover all of them, and we want to do computation on all of them, really, it will take the whole semester just to talk about flow assurance. So I want just to show you, to mention the most important issues that you have to take into account, and then we are going to do our example with the Snow White field. Uh, we are going to do an example to show you uh, the particular challenges in that case. Okay, so that's one of the issues. And what is the main problem? Why, why, what is the main problem with uh, transportation? Do you think, or why, why? So one of them is is pressure drop. Okay, and pressure drop in a way is just loss of energy. The fluid is losing energy when it's being carried in the pipe. Okay, due to friction, due to gravitational, uh, uh, gravitational acceleration, etc. Then what is another issue? Formation of hydrates. Yeah, but just before that, just very on the basics. When the pressure drops, also fluid becomes begins to come out of solution. If it, we're talking about oil, gas begins to come out of solution, and then also if it's gas, then oil or water begin to come out, begin to condensate. So pressure drop can cause also gas liberation. or liquid condensation. Okay. And you say, okay, what is the problem so much if I have two phase? I all the time have two phase in the whole system. So what happens if I get more gas? What why is what is the what is the issue there? Okay. For gas case that's extremely important. Okay, if you have the the liquid drops out of the gas then it becomes, remember that we have to carry that liquid. And usually the way to carry it is that the two velocities should be very similar. If I have too much, uh, I ha if I have too many hills up and down, up and down, okay, what will happen? The liquid will tend to accumulate and then the gas is going to bypass it. Then I have an accumulation, I have a plug of liquid and that's not very good for pressure drop tra and transportations, okay? Also something else is intermittent, so that's one thing, okay? Liquid accumulation. And that creates extra pressure drop. Liquid accumulation and is, is uh, uh, difficult to transport. And um, what were we, we going to write here? Hmm? Extra pressure drop. Okay, extra pressure drop. <coughs> well, 
Also, what happens if we are saying, okay, now let's go to the case of extreme case of liquid. What happens if the temperature drops? What happens with the viscosity of this liquid? Increasing it's increasing, ways. okay? So sometimes really for heavy oils or for fields that have heavy oils or with a high viscosity, the temperature is critical. The temperature can tell you if that fluid is going to be able to flow or not, okay? And sometimes it can be very dramatic, increase in a few hundred orders of magnitude, and then you are stuck. You just cannot flow that fluid anymore on the pipe. So temperature control is very important. And actually there was an exercise last, um, we have given last course. This exercise was about um, a crew that was, was in the South China, China Sea that was uh, being sent from the wells all the way to, to shore. And you had to calculate the pressure drop due to friction losses in different parts of the pipe, okay, to do an integration of the pressure loss. And you see that with the temperature going down, the viscosity was increasing very much. And at the end, most of the pressure drops in the pipe were happening just by the end of the pipe, okay? That, I think, you are not going to get it this, um, this semester. You're going to get um, yeah, different exercise, but just to let you know, temperature drop, okay? And that's because of you get high liquid viscosity and also gas liquid dropout. Okay, liquid condensing in the gas, and that <coughs> can create a lot of issues. Then comes all the other issues on top of all of these that could happen. Uh, also something that I mentioned, what happens when you get gas and liquid? What combination, what thing you might encounter on the pipe that you don't like? Remember, all the time we want that when we open the, the tap of oil, okay, there will be a constant stream, nice stream, okay, that we see, and we all the time, the dollars come out of this tap, okay, because we see it's sta it steady. But what happens when we have a mixture of, what could happen if we have a mixture of gas and liquid? Okay, you get, and then nothing comes out, nothing comes out, nothing comes out, okay? We don't like this because it's a kind of an intermittent operation. First, so why we don't like, let's call that intermittent flow. Okay, so why we don't like too much intermittent flow? Remember, the people in the processing, you can imagine that there are some, some people that they are, let's say, rigid, okay? They like everything to be exactly like you promise. And if you come and you say, now I'm going to give you oil, now gas, now oil, now gas, they don't like this, okay? At all. So it's not good for the processing facilities. Okay? Okay, unless they are designed for that, okay, unless they are designed to take this extra slot. But if you take a normal separator, as I mentioned some time ago, and then there comes a slug of liquid, <coughs> it's going just to collapse. If the volume is not big enough to take this slug of liquid that is coming in, it's just going to collapse. Then you will get liquid coming into the gas, gas coming into the liquid, and really the process cannot be, has to be shut down an emergency shutdown, and then that causes even more losses that just trying to tackle the problem, okay? What other things could intermittent flow cause? A structural damage, okay? Like can cause structural damage in jumpers, okay, and in pipe connectors, if you remember how was how was uh, the jumper look like? You remember the all of you remember the jumper? No? I think we had a figure someplace that we had the <coughs> module with the wellhead and then we had a piece of pipe going like this and then we had here a template. Hmm? All of you remember this structure that was a pipe going up and down, a jumper, okay? 
when there is slug flow passing through these connectors, then you have vibrations. They begin to vibrate. When they begin to vibrate, you might have something called fatigue, structural fatigue, and they might break. And if they break, first they have to pay a lot of money to the, to the state because they are releasing undesired oil to the system. Then they have to do an emergency shutdown, and then they have to go and replace the pipe. So big, big issue. Jumpers, pipe connectors, also the same thing can happen in risers. Due to vibration, flow-induced vibration. <clears throat> I, I think I have here some that in the case of Snow White, we mentioned that they were waiting for slugs. Okay, they say this is a very long transportation pipe. We're going to have condensation of liquid anyhow, so we are, cannot avoid at all the slugs. They will be coming some slugs. So they decided instead of using the normal separator, gravity-based separator, they decided to use a slug catcher. And here there is an animation. I think you have seen the pictures. Okay, there are some long pipes that they are joined by a header. A horizontal header and there's some long pipes that are joining these headers and this is just shows a bit how the flow <coughs> goes inside this lock catcher Okay, and the idea is to, that it makes, it kind of splits the main flow in different <coughs> areas or in different cavities, okay? And then the transient is more difficult to propagate through the whole structure. Then it has a long volume and big volume that if something happens, you know, it is split, it has a lot of volumes where to propagate all the transients and all these volumes of slugs that they come. And of course, it's designed for those kind of expected volumes, okay? So these are some ways to tackle uh, this intermittent flow. Uh, and of course, the intermittent flow also causes extra pressure drop. And if you think about that you have, for example, a piece of pipe going up and down, this is a typical, this happens typically in uh, in um, this gas with liquid uh, flow lines, okay? You have the gas and you have the liquid going down, okay? And usually you might happen, what might happen is that the liquid begins to accumulate in the pipe until it blocks completely the pipe. Then the gas begins to be compressed and the pressure at this point begins to increase, increase, increase until it's enough just to flush the whole liquid through another section, okay, to push it towards another section, and then again it starts over. So you get kind of a additional pressure drop because this one has to build up. In the meantime, if this pressure is increasing, then you get less rate, okay, building up, building up, building up, and then when the pressure is enough, it just pushes the whole plug of liquid to the next se section, okay. So we don't like that so much, but sometimes if we want to, you know, we cannot have usually everything that we want. You know, if we want to don't do separation, just commingle the production and send it, we might have the risk that we have these issues, okay? And we have to live with it, okay? Now, um, yeah, so there are other things, and here we go to this flow assurance, to this particular flow assurance part. So that's, a uh, Transient, okay, intermittent flow or transient flow. Okay. 
and really they are sometimes that um, like let me sh um, where did it go Like this case is, uh, um, I think we have some students here from Tanzania. That there was a new uh, recent discovery of stat oil in Tanzania, a gas field, and they were planning on developing it. Let me show you a figure where it is. Okay, Tanzania, an offshore Tanzania, and actually, actually it's quite deep. It's like 2,000 meters deep. And they wanted to develop, it was a series of formations that they want to develop it. And the distance, I'm not sure exactly how much is it. Uh, maybe it's mentioned here someplace. Okay, 2,000 to 2,600 meters, uh, quite deep, and the distance is something like Snow White, okay? I think 100 and something kilometers. And really, they could not trust the, they were using for that the, at a very early stage to be able, if you will be able to flow the fluid to, uh, through the pipeline or not. They were using Olga. And they really could not trust the results of Olga because they say there is not much measure, not many measurements done in that region for that particular fluid for those part, for that particular uh, speed. So before taking a decision if to go forward with the project or not, the flow assurance part was so important that they decided just to do another experimental campaign that this paper is discussing, just to get more data and try to see if the results of the model they were accurate enough so they can trust that they can say for sure if they will be able to produce or not this rate okay and just because of in this case the gas is quite uh, so you see here with the topography you see the production system okay that you have from different reservoir units safarani lavani and there should be another unit someplace i think there is one okay this is the profile the elevation profile Uh, yeah, this is how they are going to produce. Okay, so sometimes, and here is how they were taking because they don't have exactly all the details of the system, all the si all the details about the composition. They don't know exactly where the pipe is going to go, so they have to put a lot of uncertainties. And at the end, trying to compute what will be the average pressure drop or the most probable pressure drop that I will have to overcome to transport this liquid, exactly like we have done for the total recoverable reserves okay <clears throat> so usually uh, so let's put that comment here usually for long transportation distances multi-phase flow We use uh, transient simulators okay we don't use this uh, pipe seam or usually don't use pipe seam or gap you might use them to get a a uh, rough approximation, but at the end you want to use something that is only specialized in multi-phase flow, because really it can make a difference if you imagine if you if this multi-phase ex expert that we are using makes an error of 10 percent or 20 percent in a pipe section, and then we have a section of 100 kilometers, that error is going to accumulate, 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 and then at the end you might might give you that you you cannot flow, you cannot or if you run the steady state model, then it tells you that there is no slug. And actually, when you put to operate the system, you get huge slugs that you didn't capture in your system. So you want to know uh, in a very accurate way what is happening in your system. Okay, let's take a break and we come back with the rest. We, uh, we come back. Come back to the...
to the episode, yeah? Okay, so, uh, so usually for these kind of things, for uh, in flow patterns, multi-phase flow, we use Olga or Leda, or I think there is another software, but it's not used too much, so I just stick with Olga and Leda. Um, both of them technologies, Norwegian technologies, developed here in um, yeah, Olga in Oslo and Leda here in, in Trondheim. Uh, yeah, so these are kind of a quick overview of all the major issues that you might have in a, about flow assurance in a production system. Okay, this PVT fluid composition is that what I was saying. Sometimes you get condensation, you get evaporation. So this come defined uh, particularly by the PVT and the fluid composition. And you see here the range where it goes from reservoir well, pipelines, and process. Then you have asphaltines, which are a special heavy components that they precipitate in a solid form. We will show some. I will show a picture later. Scale is uh, um, uh, due to water with uh, solids, with minerals, with brine that they attach to the walls. Rheology that. Yeah. Okay, uh, here you see the pictures, phase behavior, the phase envelope, scale, it can actually clock very much the pipe. Asphaltines, uh, these don't happen too much on the, on the wells and pipelines, but most in the separators, in the processing equipment. You can get also corrosion. Um, yeah, fluid behavior and control is more or less the same as phase behavior. You can get wax, okay? heavy chains uh, that they also when the temperature goes down they become to precipitate solid uh, and then the the thing is that they accumulate in the pipe wall okay when it's cold when you have heat transfer usually the pipe wall is colder than the rest of the fluid and when that happens it tends to stick to the walls and and then when it sticks to the walls it creates additional frictional losses because you get more roughness and it begins to create more pressure drop and also at the end it could also block the pipe like in the case of scale okay so increased uh, pressure drop and pipe block pipe blockage Emulsions, we already discussed about them. Um, and also, it might cause that the, our fluid is non-Newtonian. With non-Newtonian fluids, they can have all kinds of funny things. One behavior, for example, if they don't flow until you don't put a, an initial pressure drop, and then when you put that initial pressure, is that they begin to flow at that particular point, okay? Uh, also, you can get this emulsion behavior. You can get also hydrates. Hydrates, it's basically uh, a nice kind of, not, not a nice, but an ice type structure that where hydrocarbon tends to lodge inside. I think we have, we have some pictures here. Yeah, so this is a wax plug, a famous picture. I, I think you have seen it before. This guy just became famous. If he just charged by the picture, will be will be rich. Okay. Wax hydrates. Here you have a kind of a nice plug of hydrate. I'm not sure how they made it to to put it to pull it out. Okay. And how the hydrates are formed. Uh, okay. You have different structures. Here I have I think one. Okay, you have different structures depending on what is, you have to have some kind of a cage that is formed by the water, that is solid. And then inside of this cage, you might have different molecules that you have, usually they are light hydrocarbon molecules like methane, you have ethane, and you also have sometimes propane, but that's a slightly too big. And they are just stable. They form this cage and they, um, they are just stable and just they behave just like ice and they can pluck your pipe. 
Uh, what else did we have? Forgot to mention. Foam. Uh, well, you see what is a foam? It's an emulsion, but it's of, of gas and liquid emulsion. Um, Hydrates, yeah. I think we cover mo most of them. So, yeah. What are the solutions basically with all of these, um, with all of these issues, with all of these uh, problems? Oh, yeah. I forgot one more. Uh, we have also erosion. Okay. Erosion due to droplets of liquid okay erosion due to droplets of liquid due to gas bubbles okay that they impinge maybe they are at high speed droplet drops of liquid that they impinge in different parts let's say for example we have a, an elbow okay and we have a flow of gas with some droplets of liquid and then they begin to impinge or they begin to hit very much this elbow and then they cause the effect of all of these droplets hitting there all, all the time every day is going to cause uh, some problems in the integrity of the pipe okay and also one big thing about erosion who is causing usually the erosion sand okay sand production so also that's th that's something that was not in this picture, and it it's a big part of flow assurance. Uh, I guess you also you so this is not new for you I guess, no you saw already this from before, roughly, no. I'm trying to go a bit quick because I think uh, it's not the main part of the course, but you have to have some idea what kind of things you might find. Um, okay, uh, hydrates. Usually, what we um, hydrates usually there is you have pressure and temperature, and here you have your envelope someplace. Okay, your hydrocarbon envelope, and usually there is a line that you can calculate. You can either use a correlation. I think those of you taking natural gas, you're actually calculating how to estimate this line. Okay, um, but you can estimate the line, and this line separates in two regions. One of them is a safe to operate region. If you are operating in this combination of pressure and temperature, you won't have any hydrate problems. And if you're operating on the left side of the line, then you are, you, there could be formation of hydrates. And all of these, like in the in the wax, they are, they, you see that they begin to appear at a certain combination of pressure and temperature. If you are working at this pressure, okay, and you are at this temperature, you will have formation of hydrates. And if you are at this temperature, you won't have formation of hydrates, okay? And the formation means that just the first crystals or just the first uh, structures of ice begin to form. And then they begin to agglomerate or they begin to stick to each other to form bigger and bigger and bigger structures until they begin to block the pipe, okay? In the case of wax, as I told you, it's slightly different. Also, you have the, the, the first formation of these crystals of wax, and they begin to agglomerate together, but also they tend to stick to the wall. In the case of wax, it's because the, the surface of the pipe, remember that the heat transfer goes in that direction, so all the time this temperature is greater than the temperature outer in the pipe, and due to this low temperature in the wall, it tends to stick and it stays there, okay, the wax. And you see here, for example, for the particular case of hydrates, when you um, inject, you can inject an inhibitor, and this is um, a monoethylene glycol, or you can also put a methanol. And you see that when you inject what we call a hydrate inhibitors, then the line moves, shifts to the left, all the time allowing us to operate in kind of a bigger operational envelope. Okay. So what are the solutions for most of these issues that we have for most of these things that we, uh, that we have named? Pressure. 
Hmm? Don't flow. Don't flow? Yeah. It's not an issue if we want to make money. <laughs> I think high pressure. Okay. One thing is to keep, but remember, it does very difficult because when the pipe circulates through, when the fluid circulates through the pipe, it creates some pressure room. Okay. So one way is to try to keep all of these. If you see, I think I have one picture of wax, or I don't have. Okay, for wax, I think the plot is slightly similar, but it's more vertical. For wax, is something like this. It's almost a vertical line. And the way you do it for, at least for hydrates, you can get it from uh, the equilibrium line, hydrate, equilibrium line. You can get it either from correlation, from measurements or from an equation of state okay you do an equilibrium of the hydrate phase in solid and, and and liquid and from there you find where at which pressure and temperature you will have formation of hydrates okay very simple to the way we do flash calculation EOS uh, equilibrium In the case of wax, usually we have to do a test, laboratory tests. Okay. To find exactly to put the crude at certain pressure and temperature and go and reduce the temperature until we see the first crystals of wax that appear. And that's how we record this point and we repeat for different pressures, for different, yeah, for different pressures. Uh, so really, uh, the the way that you can cope with these issues is um, injection of chemicals. Okay. In the case of wax, in the case of hydrates, you inject something that, uh, in the case of hydrates, is methanol or monoethylene glycol, that they impede that the water will form these structures, that the water will form ice and it will impede the, the formation of the hydrate. And in the case of wax, it's a substance that retards, that causes that the temperature at which the first crystal of wax will form, will appear, is delayed and is at a much lower temperature. Okay? One other approach is to, um, to keep, conserve the heat, conserve the heat, okay, or avoid uh, the temperature drop, high temperature drop, okay, and for that really it's a bit limited what we can do because there is all the time the environment or the sea is at a lower temperature than the fluid so we will have a heat transfer so the idea is in a way to inhibit or to try to reduce the heat transfer as much as possible and uh, and uh, yeah, I had a picture okay like a transportation pipe all the different layers that it has in a way to shield the the the, the fluid or try to heat, try to conserve the heat in the pipe and also one approach that some people use is that they try to put a, some kind of bundle I think I have a better picture some other place okay. some kind of bundle that has everything, that has the, fl the flow line, has the thermal insulation, has the power cables if you need to connect some, some, uh, something that requires power, it has the hydraulic lines, it has also the chemical injection lines, it has everything built in, and in a way everything is kind of in a bundle trying to keep in, in the idea is to keep in a better way the heat, okay, to avoid the, that the temperature will drop so dramatically. But of course that's limited, 
And a very important measure to for the particular case of wax is to perform what? Why do we have all the time two lines, one test, one production, uh, pigging? Okay. Really, with if you isolate a lot the, the pipe, also there are some some pipes that use uh, electrical heating. Okay, that they have just an electric resistance and they put certain difference of voltage in the pipe and then they circulate uh, a current and this heats the pipe. Of course, this is very expensive and it's only used in some areas where you really need them, that the temperature is very low or it's a section of pipe that is kind of naked, it doesn't have a good protection. But these measures and injection of chemicals, they are in a way kind of slowing down or it's a fix that is really not to appear, okay? But when I have some kind of some wax deposition in the pipe, I just really was the only solution is just to make pigging, okay? Just to do regular pigging. Okay, and I think that's the was the short and disorganized intro, uh, uh, lecture, not lecture, but comments about uh, flow assurance. So now we are going to go and, and yes? Yeah, uh, about the pigging, mm -hmm. it takes place only in the template area, right? Mm -hmm. What about uh, the wax or the hydrates that we form uh, later on in the pipe? Uh, usually if the temperature keeps high enough, so you don't have to do a pigging in these areas, okay? But for areas, for example, for connectors, I don't have a drawing here. Okay, so you do, for example, pigging here, okay? Usually these pipe sections, they might have some electrical heating to keep them warm in the meantime. When you are doing stopping or you are starting up, they have some heating that you can apply. Um, and the temperature inside the wells, it remains hot enough so you won't have formation of wax or hydrates, okay? But also, if you're going to make a stop, what you make sure is that you pump enough chemicals so you inhibit, the for some hours at least, the formation of wax or the formation of hydrates in your system, okay? So the other time when you, unless it's something that is not programmed, but all the time you try to pre prepare your shut your shutdown of the system by injecting pre-injecting a lot of chemicals to in in the system okay and by the way these chemicals it's like uh, okay these chemicals they are actually very expensive okay all the chemicals that we use to control scale to control um, uh, wax and to control hydrates actually they are very very expensive and also it's not like only you put them in the system and you let them go and you lose them, but actually you try to recover them by the end of the pipe to be able to re-inject it again, okay? And also, maybe you, maybe I failed to mention, but you have the wells, okay? And you have the production system and then you have the pipe. Actually, you have to send the pipe from the production facilities all the way down to each well to distribute whatever you are the hydrate inhibitor or the wax inhibitor or the scale uh, inhibitor so you have to have a line and usually it's a thinner line of course it's not like the production line and that serves to carry the and distribute the the chemicals to every well okay and that's what this this part is this idea is about when you have pipes coming from the wells and pipes coming to the wells to distribute the chemicals different for that we have to talk about processing those of you taking natural gas you probably have some ideas how you you can use different process you can use uh, condensing you can use evaporation you can use distillation towers you can use uh, okay, and how, how do you avoid this intermittent that's that's uh, very difficult to avoid there are some uh, if you have slogging in risers some people have, and that was actually, actually a research that was done in Norway for many years. Some people say that slugging, if you use uh, sl uh, choking, if you have, for example, a pipeline in the, in the seabed, and then it's going up and goes to the platform, okay, and you have slugging in this section, one solution that people are using and actually is in use in hydrogen is to put gas 
lift at the at the base of the riser. Okay, so like that you stabilize, you add more friction into the system, and you stabilize, and you don't get slug anymore on the riser. Okay, some other approach is that they have a valve, a choke valve in the platform, and they open and close, open and close, open and close. Well, not open and close, but they change the openings until they get the stabilized the flow. Okay, just by choking, by adding a pressure drop. Okay, but really, if you are in a long transportation line, there is not much you can do because you cannot play with the system really. To you cannot introduce something to the system if it's not gas or if it's not choking to make it stable. Yeah, you can, but what happens if you calculate and then you obtain slug flow? What are you going to do? If you're in the design phase, for example, and you see that the flow is because you had a terrain like that and you, I don't know, was because of a particular up and down, okay? Then you can do something and feel, for example, this structure and make it flat, okay? So the pipe will go straight and not have any, uh, to reduce the number of hills in the pipe, okay? But if you're already in the operational phase and you're getting slug, there is not nothing you not much you can do about it. Besides these measures about gas lift, injection gas lift, anti slugging measures. Gas lift. And you have choking at riser or at platform. The slug flow is something that everybody is afraid of, and yeah, and they try to avoid it, but sometimes you have to live with it. Like in the case of Snow White, there is nothing you can do. That's why you have to build a slug catcher. And that's why you're interested to see exactly when hap when it happens and when you're going to have it. And also to determine what is going to be the size of the slugs. Is if it's a slug of one kilometer, so you need to have certain volume. If it's a slug of more kilometers, then yeah, you need to have more and more volume. Okay. Okay, so let's go to our exercise. We're going to do um I recommend you to try to do it with me because it's an uh, exercise and if you do it right now, you don't have to do it later. But of course, you're welcome to do however you want. Uh, we are going to look at the particular case of Snow White, the, this big pipe. Our, our case of Snow White field, that is a remote field in the Barren Sea, where you have a, a cluster of wells, in this case we have nine, that they are producing to a pipeline entry module, and then we have a pipeline of 158 kilometers all the way to the LNG plant. And this is where we have our slug uh, capture, a slug catcher. And uh, uh, let's see, okay, so I'm giving, I'm actually saying that uh, you actually initially remember we did the calculations assuming dry gas this is not the case anymore here we have the composition of the of the gas and it says okay we're going to use really we don't have Olga or we have it but we have too few licenses and it's a bit complicated to use so I'm going to show you a simplified analysis on HISIS and more or less that's what is used in that's what you try the kind of analysis that you try to make in, in Olga uh, so we're going to put in HISIS just a very simple system. We're going to put an inlet stream, a pipeline of 158 kilometers, and then an outlet stream. Uh, and we are going to put a separator, okay, representing the slug catcher at 30 bar. Uh, here, are, here is some data. Um, and there are three different isolations that we want to try to see what is the impact or how is the heat transfer depending on each insulation. The one that is the smallest value, it means that it's protected the best or it has the thickest insulation with uh, something is beeping. It has the thickest insulation 
or the most uh, that protects most shields most the heat from the pipe to the environment and the biggest number is that it has the highest heat transfer so we want first to calculate the pressure drop and the temperature drop in the pipeline uh, using HISIS and we have uh, the elevation profile I think I had it here I took it from a presentation from Statoil is this one okay you can see it's actually quite abrupt and has a lot of up and downs up and down so you can see here each point is a kind of a, a not a, how you say not a prognostic for disaster but it's a, you might have liquid accumulation issues in many points in the pipe but we are not going to put all of these points because otherwise we will never finish and we are going to use a simplified topology that I put also in this drawing okay so kind of a flat then going down then up down and up okay and that's this simple uh, uh, profile so let's uh, you can run those of you can uh, that want to do it at the same time you can use a high sys from farm or if you have it on your computer that's okay also uh, so we open high sys and I'm going to upload also to make your life easier I'm going to upload the the data of the exercise in the in today's folder Okay, so I uploaded that information. Okay, so when you open HISIS, we are going to create a new case. And first we have to add the components. Uh, so I need maybe someone, if someone can help me or to see which components do we have to use. Nitrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, ethane, propane. Yeah, someone can help me. Yeah. Okay, so the first one was nitrogen, then CO2, okay, then methane, ethane, propane, methane, ethane, propane, isobutane and butane let's see if we go okay so far yeah then we need i pentane i think and pentane I don't know why there are two of them. Then uh, C6, C6, seven, eight, we're about to finish, nine, ten. Okay, and we have the full list of, co of components that we are going to use. So now the second part, we go here to the tree on the left and we say, okay, how are you going to treat all of these components? What, with what tool are you going to use? And I'm going to use an equation of state. I click here add. And there are many choices that I can use. I'm going to use Peng-Robinson equation of state. 
Yeah, and if you see now on my tree on the left, everything became blue. It means that it has enough information to run. So I just go to the simulation environment where I will be able to build my system. You see, right away, give this palette with elements that I can use to build my system. And if you remember some class ago, we were using it just to calculate properties. Actually, here we have to assemble a point, okay? Um, uh, we have to we have to use exactly this system okay uh, inlet to the pipeline then we have the long transportation pipeline and then we have an outlet to the pipeline okay so for that we use something called material stream it's kind of the input if you visualize this system you can say that this is kind of a unit okay the pipe is like a unit if you give an input to this unit that is this inlet stream is going to do some calculations in this case pressure and temperature drop calculations and it's going to give you back this stream okay so this is almost like a process you can put everything in a box inlet and outlet to this process but in this case the inlet is actually the material stream and the outlet is yeah also another material stream so material stream one then I put my pipe segment is here okay and then I put out here and you see it's light blue so it means this light blue is indicating that it needs some information it doesn't have enough information to compute all the properties that it needs so I'm going to double click okay what does it need the temperature I think that data was given in the Excel sheet Uh, temperature at the pipeline 67 okay 67 uh, degrees Celsius the pressure uh, the pressure I'm not sure okay how much the pressure is going to be any anybody of you remember the pressure at the plant that we had on the that you calculated from EXO hmm? I think it was 80, right? 80 or something. But we uh, we that was with dry gas. In this case, we probably will have some liquid. So I I will say let's put 120, okay? Like a bit more than twice, a bit less than twice. So 120 kilopascal. How much is that? Actually, I can put it here in bar. Okay. And. I need something else which is I need the composition okay of that stream that is empty and that's the composition that I have provided you and let's see here if our trick works if I use just the Excel file I need mole fraction not mole percent so I have to divide this data that I gave you by 100 And let's see if the trick works. Otherwise, I will have to copy all of those values. And I'm no. Okay. Okay. So I gave now the composition, and with the pressure and the temperature, already told me. Look, you have a vapor, and but also you have a liquid phase. Okay. which is kind of normal was what I was expecting okay but I need now the molar flow so how do I calculate the molar flow is given has an input in the Excel file if you see up here I'm giving you the molar flow and how do where did this molar flow came from okay remember we have done the same a few classes ago like last week I think that we took the standard rate of gas at surface and the standard rate of condensate at surface we multiply by the surface densities and we obtain the total mass flow right and then how do i go from this mass flow to molar flow let's write it down maybe for those of you who don't remember okay mass flow of gas is equal to the 
uh, standard conditions rate of gas times the density of gas at standard conditions the mass flow rate of oil is equal to the standard condition rate of oil times the density at standard conditions of oil and from here I get the total mass flow the mass flow of gas plus the mass flow of oil okay and then with the with the um, uh, how do I convert from total mass flow to total molecular total molecular uh, mole flow I divide by no I divide by the molecular weight okay so mt divided by the molecular weight is equal to nt okay and this molecular weight how do I calculate it okay just with the composition I say molecular weight of the mixture is just going to be equal to the sum of the xi and mwi right where this is the mole fraction that clear yeah so I, I saved all of this procedure for you I just gave you already the molar I save it also the work for me so three six Okay, and now it's green. I think it has all the information that it needs to run. That stream is uh, it's uh, dark blue. Now I want before before putting all the all the rest of the system together, I want to exam to see how the face envelope of this of this stream looks like. Okay. So I open the stream. I go to attachments in the upper part. I go to analysis and I click on create and in this create I see that there is something called envelope then I click on view performance is a bit difficult cumbersome to enter but finally here is the envelope of the mixture Okay, what pressure do we have? It was 120, I think it was here, right? And the temperature is 67. So 67, it's here, okay? We are in this point, actually we are quite inside the face envelope, okay? We are quite inside of the mixture region, okay? That clear so far? Yeah. Uh, by the way, how many of you have used ISIS before? Two, only. Okay. Okay. So we have the inlet stream. Now we have the outlet, and let's see if we need anything else. Let's click inside this pipe. Okay, that is going to represent this 158 kilometers pipe. So you see what it needs, it needs an inlet, okay? In this case it's number one, it needs an outlet, number two, but it also needs an energy component. And that really is representing how much energy loss is being dropped or how much energy is being transferred to the environment along the pipe, okay? And we don't have that stream. So if you click here very, very carefully, you will see that you have material stream and you have energy stream. So that's what the pipe needs to run. So I'm going to connect this Q10 to the pipe. And now let's put some better names to everything. One, I'm not going to call it one, but I'm going to call it FLEM, okay? Pipeline entry module. Okay. Then this point, I'm not going to call it two, but I'm going to call it separator. and this Q I'm not going to call it Q but I'm going to call it heat losses okay 
it doesn't have enough it's still if you see around the 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 element it has some kind of uh, jello lines and that means it doesn't have enough information to run of course if you think about it we haven't given any information about the length of the pipe about the heat transfer coefficient about the elevation we haven't given anything <coughs> almost anything to this pipe so let's uh, see here to the left you see connections that's the first step that you want to go to connect which streams are connected to this element but then you go to parameters and you see um, which correlations or which multiphase flow expert you're going to use and you can see a list very similar to the one that prosper was using and gap uh, let's see what else you have calculation okay is going to remember this is a uh, a calculation stepwise calculation in the pipe is going to split the pipe in sections and then it's going to compute in each section pressure and temperature drop okay uh, emulsions okay is using Heise's method for emulsion nothing else here okay so here there was no information about the pipe I go to rating okay and in rating I uh, is where I can put segments or pieces of pipe Okay. Thing because of time, we won't have time to put the whole elevation. So let's let's uh, do a simplification. What do you prefer? I, I do it quickly, or we con we continue tomorrow. Huh? Tomorrow? Yeah. For tomorrow, who votes for tomorrow? Yeah. All of you. Okay. But are you going to remember where where we where we were? Yes. Yeah. Promise? Yeah? Okay. So see you tomorrow. <coughs>